Cool. Screen. So you have everyone. Everyone's good. Oh, there's one more person entering. So let's just admit them. Yeah, we're good. Yep. So welcome, I guess we already said this, but welcome to the first ever developer toolkit bootcamp calling it uh, DTB 1.0. Uh, hopefully many to come in the future. Uh, so my name is Mohammed. Uh, I'm a engineering student at Memorial University uh, and I lead the operations team at Hackfrost. I got my two partners here with me. Uh, you guys want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Jack Harry. I'm a computer science student, uh, currently vice president of the uh, CS Society, um, also professional software developer currently at um, Colab Software. Um, I am also on the operations team at Hackrox. Hey, and um, hello, everyone. My name is Kamel. I'm the lead organizer for Hackfrost and Elle, and I am currently a junior programmer at um, Enov Marine. Uh, did I mention that I'm an engineering student as well? No? I don't think you did, no. I forgot to mention where I work, and you forgot to mention what you do in school, so <laughs> we're even. Cool. All right. All right, cool. So this is us. I uh, would like to know you guys in the in the Discord. If you want to introduce yourselves, go ahead and do that. Uh, so let's get into it. Um, so you probably know Hackfrost from uh, our hackathon back in February. Um, we had a hackathon uh, that had 200 plus participants. Um, we had 25 projects presented. Uh, we were able to get seven workshops done in that uh, in those two days. We had 12 mentors participate to help the participants out. Uh, we also had a $3,000 internal prize that we gave out and also a donation from IBM of $120,000 in cloud credit for the winners. And we had around 10 sponsors and five partners. Uh, so once, once this hackathon was over, we thought it was pretty successful and we thought we wanted to keep this going. Uh, and the way to do that is just host more events, uh, get our get our mission statement out there, which we'll get into right now. So yeah, so I'm not gonna read this out. If you wanna read it, go ahead. But essentially what we're trying to do is uh, we're trying to bridge the gap between the classroom and the workplace. As students ourselves and like junior developers at companies, we noticed that what we learn in school doesn't necessarily translate as well in the workforce. Uh, there's that missing link in between from the theory we study in school and the practice in the work uh, in the workplace. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to put out as many events and boot camps as possible so we can just bridge that gap and fill that gap uh, with the necessary tools uh, for people to move forward. Um, so that's our mission. Um, come on, you want to go ahead for yep. our goal of this boot camp? So the, the goal of this boot camp is similar to what um, Mohammed just mentioned about our mission at Hackfrost is bridging the gap. Um, so hopefully we'll get many things out of this bootcamp by the end of the three weeks. Uh, there are three things here that we mentioned on. First thing is growing your network and meeting new people. There are 50 of you here and um, we're all basically in the same boat that we're all learning. Uh, so it's good to, you know, get to know other people and uh, work together and help each other out. Also engaging in lively discussion. Uh, we want to keep you know, this whole bootcamp a uh, very interactive experience for you. Uh, so we'll be taking questions sometime during the sessions and also the Discord is available for you anytime outside the sessions. Um, third point is learn. So you know, the, the goal of this bootcamp is to, for you to learn how to build a website and to learn a lot of the technologies that are used in the industry. So hopefully it's a good learning experience for you too. Um, Jack, would you like to go next? Sure. So our current timeline, as mentioned in, in Eventbrite and stuff, is um, to today, our introduction, as you're experiencing right now, we're also going to go into version control, some terminal stuff as well, VS Code, kind of mostly some like high level starter stuff. Um, tomorrow, our second session on July 18th is going to go into more into the back end. Uh, this is going to be a lot of 
Python, a lot of Flask. Uh, next week, we're going to be covering cloud hosting. So the actual website that we build uh, today and tomorrow, next week we'll learn how to actually put it on the internet. And then the week after that will be UI design. Uh, our current focus will be more on the back end, but nearing the end, we'll spend some time talking about uh, CSS, some better HTML practices, and actually making the website we produced during this bootcamp look a bit nicer. Yep. Uh, so just to, so you guys probably already know what the what the goal of this uh, bootcamp is to have your own personalized project at the end. And the project is essentially a portfolio for you to showcase your projects, your skills, your experience, and so on. Um, as well as there's a blog app component. So a lot of developers like to write things online and blog. So uh, we're going to create like an application that allows you to do that. Um, so this is the kind of the tech stack that we're going to be using. We're also going to be using Flask um, uh, and Python for the backend. Uh, we're going to design uh, the website using HTML, CSS, JavaScript. We're going to host it in a hosting platform called Python Anywhere. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it's, it's a pretty new hosting platform, but it makes it very easy. And we'll go over that probably in day three. Uh, for database, we're going to use SQLite. Um, Jack is uh, pretty experienced in that area, so he'll give you the rundown tomorrow. Um, and yeah, so we can show you, just so you know, we can show you what the end project uh, would look like. So by the end, basically of, I'd say the third session, we want to have the kind of the bare bones of the project. And that's, that's, not, that's not actually our goal for the bootcamp, but designing and customizing your, your own version of the website is up to you. And that's kind of the $200 prize that we put in the event, right? And the poster, if you've seen that, we will be picking the best website that's been designed uh, one, from one of you guys. And the, like the people that participate the most uh, will get a better chance at that. So we'll go into what that would look like. So this is kind of the, the, the main, I would say, skeleton of the, uh, of the website. Jack, you want to give them a rundown on this? Sure. Um, so I put this together as basically the like example page. Uh, it purposely doesn't have a lot of color to it. It's kind of meant to be a uh, example of what you can build. You'll see here just an introduction page like, hello, my name is John Doe. Grab some random stock photo nonsense and then threw a piece of text below it. And then a couple social buttons, pretty uh, standard stuff. If you want to head to the projects page, um, so we have a list of projects. Um, the way that this is actually like uh, pulled on the back end is actually from GitHub itself. Um, as you can tell by a lot of stock photos, this is just written here as an example with a bunch of links to some different uh, projects. There's a contact screen at the end as well, uh, which right now isn't wired up to actually end up anywhere. But we're, we're gonna discuss, discuss how you actually build the back end of this. Uh, there's also then I guess the biggest piece is the actual blog itself. So if you head to the blog section, you'll see we have two example blog posts. So you can click on the first entry there, if you don't mind Mo, and you'll see there is just a example blog post which shows different markdown formatting. And at the top of the page, you'll see a bunch of reacts. So if you click some of those, you'll see it'll uh, add those reactions. And if you refresh the page, it'll actually uh, persist those because it's uh, stored on the back end into a uh, persisted database. Um, so although of course this site is super complex, we're trying to keep this relatively like entry level. We know some of you here might not have much experience when it comes to this kind of stuff, um, but where the, it's definitely a lot to do to get to the point where you'll be, be able to uh, complete an application like this. Um, yeah, and we actually have this website hosted on Python anywhere, so anybody can access this through this link, um, as well as the source code is also uh, in our GitHub. Uh, you can go in here. This is not for you. Uh, we'd rather you write your own, but if you need the, to reference any of it throughout the bootcamp, you can uh, through this repository. Um, so as we said, this is kind of like a bare bone skeleton of the of the uh, of what the project should look like. But then once you go in and get this ready and done, you can customize your own and make it look something like, for example, like Jack's website, where he's added his own color palette, added some of his own uh, stuff here. 
or for example, my website, same thing, you can add your own kind of like whatever you need. Um, and basically by the end of it, by the end of session four, we want everyone to kind of submit their URL to their website that's hosted on Python anywhere. And we'll take a look at all of them and decide uh, the best looking one or the one that has the most effort and give them a prize for that. So we can go back. This is probably a good segue to services. So we have a, a link to the Discord within um, uh, within the channel. You can click on that. I know a few, few people already have. Um, we have a few channels in the Discord. Anything that starts with bootcamp hyphen is the place to go for that. Um, we have our announcements. We have the general chat, also a help section dedicated for debugging any issues you might have. Um, and we also have the docs website. So um, I'll be showing that more later off, but basically everything covered in the, uh, in the, the bootcamp from, you know, the sessions themselves to the format of the sessions, uh, some deliverables, the actual like content themselves, we're putting all of this, um, all of this content is on our, uh, our uh, GitHub pages site. Um, and yeah. Cool. Yeah. So this is a great resource. If you miss any of the sessions or if you have, um, if you miss like a certain command or a certain step, you can come back here and read, the, uh, and read this through. We also have like hyperlinks to things you need to install and so on. Uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty good place to start. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, all the work uh, that's been done uh, wouldn't have been possible without you know, a big team behind the, the scenes. And our team is 15 people strong uh, and we're growing a bit as well. Um, so I'm not gonna go through the names, but we just wanna give credit um, to everyone here for their hard work over the past few months. Um, and we hope that you guys um, you know, learn um, a lot from, from this and, you know, um, come out of it with a, with a good experience. And uh, we also have... Plug. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, my one. No, I just said we got to plug ourselves, so go ahead. Yeah, so we have uh, social media, um, also Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. So uh, if you're interested in, in following us, uh, please go ahead. We always post about our upcoming events there. And yeah. Yeah, cool. So it's probably a good place to actually start looking at some things uh, and get going with the boot camp. So before we start, does anyone have any questions you want in the comments? Any like general questions about the workflow or anything? Everyone's good? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna so, do it, but I'm staying here. Uh, so if you guys okay. need me, I'm here. Okay. Okay, sounds good. All right, the stage is all yours now. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, so first thing we're gonna cover, uh, as you saw from the breakdown of the timeline, is probably uh, is our, the terminal and terminal commands, as well as uh, just the development environment. Um, so for the people that have Linux or Mac, you can go ahead and open a terminal just to follow along. Um, if you're on Windows uh, and you have WSL installed, uh, just open a command prompt, like go in your search bar, search up command prompt and type in the word bash. If you type in the word bash and hit enter, it will start a bash session for you to kind of follow along with these commands. If you don't have a terminal, if you're not on Mac Linux or you don't have WSL, uh, you can still follow along, but some commands might not work and you have to Google the alternative uh, for Windows or DOS. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, but also this session is recorded. So if you do end up installing WSL, you can go back and follow along anyways. Um, so, so we can start, if you opened your terminal on Mac or Linux, your terminal would probably not look like this. Uh, this is a heavily customized and modified terminal. Um, this is a good segue for our first basically command. And I'm just gonna switch back to my default uh, back terminal. And to do that, I'm gonna use this command and it's called um, ch chsh. And I'm gonna use an option or a flag. I call it flag. What do you call it, uh, Jack? Uh, flags are good. I was gonna say, do you wanna hit to command plus a few times to make your terminal a bit bigger, if you don't mind? Uh, yep. Yeah. Sorry. There you go. Is that better for you guys? Yeah, a lot, a lot better. Okay, cool. 
So yeah, so I'm going to use the flag S and I'm going to go ahead and switch to my uh, default terminal or bash terminal. And if I hit type that, oh, I can't type anymore. There we go. If I type that and hit enter, it'll ask me for my password. I type in my password. And if I refresh my terminal, if I close this and open it again, it should be the default terminal. And this is what you probably see if you opened yours. Uh, whether it's Mac, Linux, or WSL. Um, so actually to get that heavily modified uh, terminal to, and like actually before we do that, let's switch back. So I'm just gonna type in the command again, but this time I'm gonna switch to my ZSH, which is a cell, the shell I'm using, uh, flag S, and gonna go bin ZSH. Ask me for my password again. And then if I, Close this and open it again. It should bring me back. Yeah, cool. So as I said, I'm using um, a modified terminal, and uh, the way I'm doing this is uh, through a um, an application called OhMyZH ZSH. So if you look this up uh, and install this, it will give you a very easy way to kind of customize your terminal. It has steps, good documentation. So go ahead um, and uh, go to this if you want. Uh, just the benefit of it is just it's much easier to develop. You can have like basically things like where you are currently, your directory, um, the time of day. You can add these. These are this is the RAM usage right now. Some some useful stuff. There's also other plugins like autocomplete and uh, syntax highlighting that uh, you'll see as we go through this. Um, so so the thing about terminals is that. Um, there's a command called man or manual. And what this will do is it will basically show you, if you don't know how to use a command, it will show you the manual for that command. So the command that we used previously, if we just type in man and then we type in the command, it will open the manual for this, uh, for this uh, command. And it will tell you that what this does is it add or change user database information. And if you look at the, the flags, we can see that the dot S flag, uh, the dash S flag uh, opens a new shell. So you can use this with like literally any command you want. Uh, if I go man clear, for example, which is probably our next command, you'll see it works as well. And to quit that uh, image, you could just open, uh, you just press Q. Uh, let me just zoom in again because I open it anyway. So yeah, so the clear command, uh, if you don't know, just clears the screen, it's pretty useful. If, uh, if you have a lot of things going on and you want to clear your screen, just type in clear. Um, if you don't want to type in clear, which is it's a long word to write. You can create aliases in, uh, in, in Bash. And the way to do that is you type in the word alias and then whatever you want the command to be. So I'm just going to say I want it to be CLL and then make it equal to the actual command. So what this will do is whenever you type CLL, it will actually redirect that to the clear command. So if I hit that and then type in CLL, it'll actually recognize that as a command and clear the screen. However, if I close my terminal and open it back up right here and I type in CLL, the alias is gone because it's kind of temporary in that session. To keep the alias there, uh, we have these configuration files for your terminal, our RC files. And if I'm using a ZSH, um, I'm using a ZSH cell, so my uh, RC is CSH RC. And to, to basically to configure that, you just want to open uh, in your home directory, a ZSH RC file or whatever shell you're using. Um, and if you if it's not created, just create it. So for me, it's already made, and it has all of these configurations that I talked about from all my ZS, all my ZSH. I can never say that word. Um, and what we want to do is create an alias here. So if you type in, uh, let me zoom in a little bit. Maybe you don't see this. And if I type in that same alias command and say CLL. So much want to enter. I type in CLL and set it to clear, and then save this. Uh, and instead, actually, another command that's pretty useful is instead of refreshing your terminal by closing and ter um, and rebooting it again, you can use the source command, and uh, you want to source this CSHRC file to basically refresh it and pick up this new line that you put in. So if we go ahead and do that and then type in CLL, and there we go, we have it. And even if you cl uh, close this terminal and open a new one, you will still have the CLL at least. 
So that's pretty cool. Um, what other things that you can use terminal for is probably like file management. Uh, it's the most common one. Um, basically, you can create directories, uh, create files, delete files, move files around, and it's pretty useful. And yes, you can do it using your mouse and keyboard, but it's I think it's much faster using a terminal. Um, and also it gives you more control in what you can do. Um, so yeah, so again, terminal, same thing as your mouse and keyboard, just anything you do with your mouse and keyboard, you can do basically through here. Um, so just an example of that, I have this, for example, IDEK, I don't even know, folder that has a bunch of, for example, a bunch of files, a bunch of different type files. Um, and I'm trying to organize this stuff. So I'm just trying to remove all the JPEG files because I don't like JPEG. Um, and to do that, like if you were to do that manually, you'd have to highlight all of these and then basically delete them. Uh, a way to do that from your terminal is uh, we can navigate to this uh, directory and then delete them using a command, which we'll go over right now. So uh, to navigate to this directory, so this is on my desktop. So to navigate, we use a command that is CD, or change directory. So we CD to our desktop. You can see we're in our desktop. And uh, another command is uh, my Siri turned on. Can you guys still hear me? Yep. OK. So another command to see what's in your desktop is ls or list. So if I type in ls, I can see the two directories that I have on my desktop, IDEK and stuff. And if I cd to my IDEK and type in ls here, I can see all the files that I see here in my finder. So now our objective is to remove to remove all the JPEG files from this directory with using just one command. So the command that we're going to be using is rm or remove, and we're going to use star to remove all, and then the extension is .jpeg. If I hit enter on that, you can see that all the JPEG files are gone. And to confirm that, we can then list, and we see that there are no more JPEG files. So these are just a few things that are useful that you can use around. Um, change directory, remove, clear is a very important one. Um, so yeah, so now we can get into probably our application or our application folder and our development environment. So uh, a good command to do that is uh, make directory. So we want to make a directory uh, wherever you want, but I'm going to do it on my desktop to basically store our first Flask project. Um, so right now I'm in my IDEK to go back. I type in CD double dot, go one directory back. I'm in my desktop now. I can see that I only have two things in my desktop. And to create a new directory, I say make directory and let's call it hello. And I'm sharing my secondary screen, but as you can see, there's a folder that's made on my desktop. To confirm, I can say list and I have hello world, IDK and stuff. And if you don't have this heavily customized um, uh, terminal and you want to know which directory you're at, you can just type in pwd or print working directory, and that will tell you where you are exactly. You can see we're in our desktop. So let's go ahead and change directory to our hello world. So we say cd hello world, and we do a list, do a list here. There's nothing. It's clean screen. Okay, so we have our hello world. Um, another command that we can, so we saw how we can create directories, but we can also create files. Um, a command to do that is touch. So we can we can create files using touch and our first file is gonna be our app.py file or our Python file that we're gonna store our hello world Flask application. So we go ahead and say touch app.py. And if we do a list here, we can see we have a app.py file. Um, so now let's get into where we can open this and start actually writing some code. So as you know, in the prerequisites, we're going to be using VS Code. Uh, so I'll have I'll open VS Code here. You can you can go through VS Code a little bit. So uh, you have this bar on the side that has a bunch of icons. This is where all your files are or your current folder with all your code files. Uh, you can you have a finder here to search. Um, you have this little like icon that's for version control or all your stage and uncommitted files, uh, which will Jack will go through in the version control session. You have a debugger. Uh, you have, this is my favorite one, uh, the extension tab or where you can install all of the extensions. Uh, we also have a section in our documentation on extensions that hasn't been populated yet, but hopefully it will be by the end of today. 
to kind of install any useful um, extensions you might need. Um, and then here, this is for testing. If you want to do unit testing, this is the tab where you can run your tests. And this last one is not here by default. So if you open your VS Code, I hope everyone has their VS Code handy next to them. And if you open this, you probably won't see this. It's just an extension that I have for live sharing uh, code between multiple people. Um, and then here you have your profile and settings. So it's pretty standard. Um, you have your file edit selection view, like typical um, configurations up top. So what we want to do now is we want to open that app.py file um, in this uh, Visual Studio code. So we can, we can go ahead and say open folder and navigate through our finder and open the file. But a cooler way to do this is to do it through command line. So to do that, you want to open your palette in VS Code that allows you to run um, scripts. So to do that on Mac, uh, it's uh, command shift P and on Windows, it's control shift P. And what you wanna do is you wanna type in shell. And when you type in shell, you'll see that there's this first uh, command right here, shell command, it installs code command and path. And what that does is um, it'll create a script that is triggered by the keyword code in your terminal to open any via, any files you want in VS Code. So if you will, if you go ahead and run that and it'll say you're successfully installed and we go back to our uh, terminal and we type in code and we'll, we wanna open everything. What that will do is we will open a VS Code with our app.py. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and here we can start our development process. So let's just expand this. Um, also to not navigate back to this, to this terminal, you can actually open a terminal in VS Code. If you go up top, there should be a terminal tab and says new terminal. So you click on that. And just like that, you should have a terminal right here. Cool. Um, so let's go through a few things on like editing code with ease, I'd say, or like some tricks that you can like help you edit code faster. So if you just type in a few things, uh, there's obviously the typical control F, control R to find and replace. That's pretty useful when you're editing things, files repeatedly. Uh, another cool thing is, um, which you guys probably know, but uh, you don't need to select the whole file, the whole line to kind of copy, paste, or cut. So if I'm just in whatever line and say command C and then go to a new line, I can just paste however time I want. Same thing with cut, I can cut many lines and then paste them again. Um, another cool one, this is probably my favorite, is um, if you press option shift, uh, in Windows it's alt shift, and then just kind of scroll your cursor up, you can multi-edit or multi-line edit. And this is pretty cool if you're working with like big lists or whatever and you wanna type the same thing over and over again. So you can type in, uh, you can sh shift highlight and delete and so on. So these are just a few tricks that you can use. Um, so yeah, so now we can start building our Flask application. And to do that, we need a few prerequisites. Well, first we need Python. So if you haven't installed Python, I hope everyone has Python, but if you haven't, you can go on the Python website, install the latest version um, and have it running. And you can watch this recording later and follow along. But if you do have Python, open it right now so we can uh, not open it, but open your VS Code, um, and we can start building our first Flask application. So to check if you have Python installed, you can type in Python 3 and then dash dash version. That should print out the version that you have installed. I have a pretty uh, outdated version. Well, it's not outdated, it still works, but it's, I think they're at 3.9 now, Jack, right? Yeah, 3.9. Okay. Cool. I mentioned it's it's okay to have an older version. It'd likely be fine. It's just might as well have the uh, freshest version you can get. Yep. And it uh, for Mac OS, it's a little tricky to sometimes to download Python because Mac OS ships with uh, Python too. Um, but there is a link uh, in our documentation to sh for a blog to show you exactly how to do it the correct way so you don't get your Python versions all tangled up. So if you have Mac OS, please go through the documentation and see how that's done. So once we uh, basically know that Python is installed, we want to go ahead and um, start a virtual environment. And the reason we're doing this is because we want to isolate this project. Any, any packages or modules we install, we want them to be isolated from our global environment, right? So anything we install will be locally in the perspective of this project. So to start a uh, virtual environment, we're gonna go ahead and type Python 3 with the flag M 
and use VM and we want to call it VM. So if we run that, and as you can see, there's a VM file here. We can confirm in our terminal. And now we need to activate this uh, virtual environment. So to do that, we type in dot VM, we navigate to the bin directory and activate. We press enter and there we go. Now our virtual environment is ready. So now from this point on, anything we install will be basically locally for this project. So first thing we wanna install is Flask, which is our main driver for this project. So to do that, we use the package installer pip and we say install Flask. And we press enter and that should do its thing. Install the most recent version. To confirm, we can say Flask version And it'll tell you you have the 2.1. Cool. So now we have Flask installed um, and we have our app.py. We have everything installed. We can start coding. So first thing we want to do is after we installed a, uh, the package Flask, we want to import it just like any module. We import it. We say from Flask import Flask. So we have that imported. And the first thing we want to do is we want to instantiate this Flask class. Uh, and this object that we're, gonna, that we're gonna instantiate is gonna serve as our web server gateway interface for the whole project. Um, so we can go ahead and create a variable called app and we, it's gonna be a class Flask. And in the argument that we're gonna pass into to this, uh, to this constructor uh, is gonna be name. And name is just a convenient way to kind of, um, for this, that it's appropriate, it's, it's, how do I explain this, Jack? How do I explain? Uh, name is a special method. If you've ever seen like, if uh, name equals main in a Python application, it just, um, depending on what uh, file actually gets invoked, like in this file, name is going to be main, but if you import a different file, then name would be something different. Um, yeah. It's something you don't have to be too worried about, to be honest. And if you run that file, uh, it should just print. Yeah, we had to say, save. save it yes. would be useful. Yep, go. it'll just print main. So yeah, if if you were to say have a separate file and then do the same thing, then it would would be different. Um, thankfully, we don't have to be too concerned with that. Yep. So we have our app. Uh, we have our class object instantiated we can start uh, coding uh, our Flask application. So what we wanna do is we wanna just basically uh, render a page that just has cell, that just says hello world. And to do that, we need to define a function. So in Python, we say def, and we'll call the function hello world. And we won't pass anything for now. And what this function is gonna return is basically our template or whatever we want to render in the, uh, whatever HTML we want to render uh, on our page. And this is cool because you can just embed raw HTML here and return it. So to do that, let's just let's just return an h1 tag. Uh, close it up, and then say hello world. Okay. So at this point, this hello world function is going to return this h1 tag that says hello world. However, our Flask application doesn't know where to render this, so we need to tell it which director, uh, which link or URL to render this at. And to do that, we use a decorator, which is, uh, or annotation with the, with, the, with the character at, and we're gonna use the app object and call the method route. And here we can pass in basically the uh, URL directory where we wanna render this hello world. So for this purpose, we're just gonna give it the home directory, which is just the forward slash. Um, so yeah, so that's it. This is the simplest hello world class. So we're pretty much done and ready to test this. So if we save this um, and run this, so to run this, we use flask run. Uh, run is just a, a flask script that will just build it up and uh, create a local host with a uh, port for you to go on and view your project. So we type in flask run. Syntax error. Uh, where's the syntax? <laughs> line, line six. Yeah. Sorry about oh yeah, guys. if you can hit uh, command plus a few times as well, if you can make the editor a bit a bit a bit bigger. I don't think command plus works. I think I need to do. 
It should should do it. Let's see what Zoom's done. Zoom. Zoom in is command equal. It's not working for me for some reason. No, it's 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 working. It just, it just made well, it. I, I clicked it. Bigger. Yeah. I, oh, yeah, the I, well, the actual like, the actual shortcut. Yeah. yeah. The shortcut wasn't working. So yeah. So we've got a colon here. Great. So we go back here. Here our screen and flask run. And hopefully it'll tell you that it's running on your local host with port 5000. So you can take this URL, put it in a browser, or you can just command click. And it opened it right here. If we look right here, we see hello world. Here we go. <laughs> our first class project. Um, another cool thing is um, let's say you want to render more than hello world. Uh, a bunch of stuff. Uh, you don't want to kind of put everything in your app.py file. Uh, it's just going to get too big, too messy. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an actual HTML file, store this H1 there, and then render uh, that HTML file. So to do that, we go ahead and um, let's go ahead and stop this for now. Uh, we used our command make directory. We want to store this in a template folder or templates folder. And we say templates. We can see we have a templates directory. And if we enter that, say CD templates, see we're in there and it's empty. And we, what we want to do is we want to touch a hello.html. And if we do a list here, we can see that we have a hello.html. And if we open it in our VS code, we have an empty HTML file. So what we can do is we can take this and put it in our, in our hello.html, save this. And now to render this, we need to import something else. And that is render template. And in our return, we're going to use this render template and pass in our hello.html. And if we save this and run, uh, you, know, you went into the templates directory. Oh, yep. Thank you. Let me save that. Oh, um, Mila asked about how did you stop it? Uh, once you start an application in Bash or the terminal, uh, Control C, um, as it says there, Control C to exit is usually how you exit most things in the terminal. Yep. And if we open this, you can see it's still Hello World. And whatever we change this HTML file and we run again, we'll see that it's that it will change here as well. So that's kind of congratulations. That's your first Flask project. Um, I hope that makes sense. If if you did miss any steps or something wasn't clear, this guide uh, that Jack spun up is pretty good. Uh, if you go to 5.2, 5.21, example one, Hello Flask in our documentation, it walks you through everything you need to do to get your Hello World up and running. So go ahead, play around with this. Um, and now I'll pass it to Jack to actually get this published on GitHub and go through version control um, and how to do that. Sure. Let me just do a quick share screen switcheroo. That was smooth. Nice. My screen visible to everyone? Yep. Great. So we have our Hello Flask. Um, I have the exact same application here, um, except mine is still the boring string, but it'll be a bit easier to uh, put this up. Um, I have a few fancy terminal applications such as bat. If you ever want to read a file from the terminal, you can do cat app.py. But if you have something like bat, you can actually uh, view it with syntax highlighting. Um, I know, Mo, you use clear quite a bit. I use control L, which is a lot nicer. <laughs> um, anyways, we have our app.py. And it would be nice to put this uh, application we've written on GitHub. Um, I assume most people here have heard about GitHub. It's a pretty popular website and heard mention of it. You might even have uh, used it to download some things in the past. 
but um, I feel a lot of people don't necessarily know exactly what GitHub is from a uh, conceptual level. Um, we have this all kind of covered on the website. Um, Git itself is not GitHub and GitHub is not Git. Um, Git itself is a re re uh, revision control system. It is a tool uh, that will be used to manage your source code history. So thankfully with the Hello World application, it's just one single file. Um, in the future, it could be, you know, tens of files, hundreds of files, some projects in the future will indeed grow to thousands of files. And of course, this website is simple enough that one person can build it. But most websites that do grow to a certain size, eventually you'll have a team of people working on them at the same time. Um, if you work in a group project in school, I know some people tend to just use, um, you know, say like Facebook Messenger, sending, you know, zipped files to each other, or they put their code in Google Drive. And while that technically is a solution, it's not a very good one. <laughs> it, it gets very tangly quite quickly, especially if you uh, if you want to do version control and say you're trying to work on a, uh, a graphic and you save the file and you call it my amazing graphic V1. But then you go, oh, there's an error in it. So you have to go back and save it as my, my amazing graphic V2. And then you're like, oh, this is my final version. So you call it my final graphic V2 underscore final. But then you realize that you have to go in and again, and you don't want to change the old stuff. So you call it graphic final V2 underscore final underscore V2. And, you know, where do you put those? Do you delete the old copies? Do you have to keep renaming them as you make new ones? Um, it gets messy quite quickly. So Git itself is a version control system. Uh, there's things like Subversion and Mercurial. Uh, Git is basically king. Git is what everyone uses nowadays. Um, and GitHub itself is a website that is used to host uh, Git repositories. You can kind of think of a repository like a folder in a way. It's usually, and it's um, shortened to the word repo uh, quite frequently. In the... Uh, Initial setup, we ask uh, if you could create your own GitHub account. Um, I'm going to skip that process during this session. I'm just going to walk through it. Uh, we also link most of what I'm going to talk about is going to be uh, based on an actual guide from GitHub called the Hello World Guide, um, which talks about what is GitHub, uh, creating a repository, so on and so forth. So I'm going to get to it. So we have our Hello World Fast project. If I open this, you'll see, yeah, this is our folder, hello flask with app.py. Uh, we have the VNV folder and the PyCache folder. These folders we don't care about. We only care about this one file. Um, so when we push this stuff to GitHub, we're going to try and make sure that we ignore the rest of these except for our one file. Um, so Git itself has a command line utility uh, called Git. If I do Git version, you'll see I have Git version 2.30. If I just type Git, tells me a whole bunch of stuff that I can do. Um, and if I do git status, quite a common command to run, it'll tell me fatal, not a git repository or any of the parent directories, not git. So to first actually create the git repository, I'm going to start locally, and we're going to push it up to GitHub afterwards. The beautiful thing about git is that you can actually have a local copy of a git repository. So you can access git while you're offline. So to actually initialize a Git repository locally, I'm going to use the command git init uh, with period, which means the local directory. So it'll tell me initialized empty Git repository in blah, blah, blah. Uh, and if I do git status, you'll see now it says on branch master, no commits yet, untracked files. So we have a couple of files in our current directory but a couple of them we don't care about. So I'm going to create a new file called .git ignore. And I'm gonna go into my VS code. You'll see there's a new file here called git ignore. And I'm gonna say, you know what? If you see pi cache or you see venv, uh, I don't want these. I want you to ignore these. So all of a sudden you'll see VS code is nice enough to grade these out. And if I do git status here, you will see it just has .gitignore and app.py. 
So we're ready to uh, create the initial commit of this project. So I'm going to do git add app.py and also git add dot git ignore. If I wanted to add everything, I could have done git add dot, um, but I added it specifically just to make sure I added what I wanted to add. So now you saw before, it showed that these were untracked files as in git doesn't care about them. But now if we do git status, you'll see they're green. So we still have no commits yet. Um, and I'll see, I'll show you what commit is in a second, but we actually want to commit these changes. So I'm going to do a commit. So I'm going to do git commit dash m initial hello world flask application. So it's telling me, it tells me that it's uh, created a new commit called initial hello world flask application. It's created dot git ignore, created app.py. And now if you do git status, it'll tell me that nothing to commit working directory clean. So now, you know, I do ls, I see my files that I have here. I usually instinctively do this, which gives you the uh, this listing. Um, but basically, our Git repository, which is still local, this still isn't, isn't on GitHub just yet, uh, has our app.py and our git ignore. We can see that by doing a command called git log. Uh, and git log will output a list of all of the git commits. So you'll see here, there is a commit that has this commit hash here, which is a unique identifier for this commit. Uh, it was authored by me. I've configured my local git to have my username in my uh, tilde.git config directory, tilde be my home directory, you'll see it sets my name and email to be that. You can, uh, when you do a commit a commit for the first time, Git will tell you how to uh, set this up. Um, and as well in this Git log, you'll see the date that the commit was made, which is useful. And also the contents, the initial hello world fast application. So this is great, but this is still on my computer. My computer goes and it burns in a fire. This repository goes with it. So I'm going to open up GitHub. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger and I am going to hit the plus button in the top right, which you'll see once you're logged in and I want to create a new repository. So I'm going to call this hello hyphen flask and I'm going to put a description here. Um, my amazing flask application. I'm going to leave it public. Um, I'm personally an advocate for having most repositories as public. If this was some sort of amazing startup idea, I might hit private, but for now I'm going to hit public and I'm going to leave all this stuff the same. Um, and I'm going to hit create repository. So now uh, there is a URL on the internet, github.com slash Jack Harry slash hello flask. So if I give this to you, I'll drop it in the chat. Um, I will have that there, but obviously this is empty. There is a Git repository on my local computer and a Git repository on GitHub. And right now they have no connection to each other. So um, GitHub's nice enough to tell you, hey, uh, here's how you do this. Um, I usually just grab the SSH URL and call it a day, um, but I'm gonna use this. So you can either use HTTPS or SSH. If you use HTTPS, uh, it's the exact same, except it'll ask you for your password every time, unless you have it configured elsewhere. I'm going to use SSH, but it doesn't matter. The commands are basically the same as you can see. Um, so we could create a new repository uh, like so, or we can push an existing repository from the command line. So I'm going to grab this git remote add origin, and this is the origin URL. And I'm going to say uh, git branch and main. I already have a branch. I don't need to do that. Uh, and push origin master. So I'm going to do git push origin master. So two things just happened. I added a remote. So git is basically aware of a repository that is remote to itself. I called it origin because um, I'm adding a new repository and I gave it the uh, URL for the um, the git URL of git at github.com colon jack harry slash hello fast dot git. So I do git remote list, uh, just git remote. 
you'll see it'll say I have one remote called origin. And if I do git remote get URL origin, it'll tell me this. Uh, and after that, I did the GD command. Also in, in the terminal, if you head up and down, it'll let you go back through your history. Very useful. I did git push origin master. So basically what that did, it says, hey, I have some, some something locally. I want to push it to a remote. I'm going to do git push as in push some code. Uh, I want to push it to origin, which is a remote, and I want to push it to the master branch. So we already ran that. Uh, this page is still stale. If we hit refresh, you will see, ta-da, our app.py and git ignore is now on GitHub. So even, you know, I can click on this, I can see my app.py, and come back, I can see the git ignore. Thankfully, of course, we don't have the pi cache or the VNV um, in this. We just have these two files. Uh, we can even see that this was added five minutes ago. We can even actually see the very commit this was added. So if I click on here, it'll actually bring me to a commit within GitHub. So the same thing that we saw in Git log here, which said commit hash, author, date, all the information that you see in your terminal is also here in uh, GitHub. Um, but this is pretty boring. You might ask, well, this was quite a bit of work to put two files online. You know, why would I worry, worry with this? I can just drag and drop some files into Google Drive. It's much easier. Where this shines is when you want to make changes to this. So let's say our uh, hello application is pretty boring. You know, we've got app root slash. Let's say I want to make it so that if I put in an arbitrary username, it'll actually say hello to that person. So let's say I want to make it. Um, I think I can just leave it like this. This might work. This is some live coding, so be wary of if this will actually work the full first time. But the idea is, and I'll say hello name, is we want to have a second route on top of the slash route that if we see, say, do slash mo or slash jack, it'll say hello name. So let's go back to our application, make sure I've got fast run running. Ooh, did not like that at all. Uh, I'm going to quickly look how to do flask parameters in URL. We're doing some uh, live Googling right here, right now. No, this is uh, great. Keep going. <laughs> this is how it's supposed to be done. This is, this is how it goes. This is uh, professional yeah. software development. Ah, angle brackets, not this. I think that's, I think I'm writing express. Too much, too much JavaScript in my life. Okay. Um, so local also 5,000 works, hello mo, there we go. So now we go to different routes and it'll now give us different data. Um, so cool. But now we wanna put this stuff on uh, GitHub, but we also want to keep track of what we've made. So the first initial version of the application where we just had one route, we wanna keep track of that. Now, VS Code is very nice. You'll see all of these lines here are green, uh, meaning these are additions. Let's say if I wanted to change this, um, I want to make all these begin with route. So I can do route hello world and uh, route hello name. You'll see even now this is orange. If I click on it, it'll actually tell me that, hey, this used to be def hello world. It's now root hello world. And it'll show me as well if I go to here, all of these are new additions. So I'm going to go back to the command line. I'm going to do git status. I'm going to see modified app.py. This is red because it's not actually staged. I'm going to do git add app.py. Now I come back in. And you'll see those are gone because this is now a staged change. What I'm going to do though is I'm going to undo. I'm going to do git restore dash dash staged. And I'm going to restore app.py. So now we've basically gone back to when it was read again and the files are here. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to use the source control feature of uh, VS Code to do this for us. So you'll see the source control option has app.py here. I can hit this plus button. It'll actually stage changes. And before I did, you know, git commit via the command line, but I can also do here like um, added new route made all functions begin with 
root that jar of nuts. Uh, it's telling me I should keep it 50, 50 character current per line. I'm gonna listen to that. So two characters. Let's get rid of the comma. It's added new rect. There we go. Usually Git uh, tells you to keep it under certain character length and I hit enter and I hit uh, I enter the check mark. You'll see um, if I do git log, you'll see there's a new commit. Uh, VS Code took, took care of it for me. If you want to use the command line, go ahead. If you want to use VS Code, go ahead. I personally vouch for using the command line for basically everything to do with Git, except for the cursed merge conflicts. Um, but it's kind of up to you, depending on your style, your preferences. Um, so now Git status, I have to do Git log. You know, we, we, we made a commit, but we still haven't pushed it yet. So git log is a bit more useful for us now. We have two commits. We have the initial hello world Flask application commit, and we have the added route, made all the functions begin with route commit. You'll see it actually tells us origin slash master, so remote slash remote branch is still on the old commit. If I go here, I refresh the page, still has the old commit. If I go into the commit list, still shows me one, and it says that master is now you know the master uh, branch that i have in my local um it even has this thing here called head which is where your local branch current points to so i'm going to do something cursed i'm going to do git checkout origin slash master and it'll complain at me saying i'm in a detached head state if i do git log you'll see i went back in time and all my changes that i made are now gone you might go, Jack, why did you do that? And I'm going to say, it's fine. Git checkout master. There you go. Git log. I'm back. I'm back to the previous commit. All the changes I made were here. I'm now back. And of course, I want to put it on GitHub. So I'm going to do git push origin master, the same commit as before. And I refresh this page with the list of commits. And you'll see, ta-da, added rect. Made all functions begin with rect. Now, if I go back to the main repository, I click on app.py, there we go. Our new route is there. And what's nice about this too, is I can actually go back to the commit list and I can click on the old commit and I can actually even click this button and I can browse what the commit looked like 12 minutes ago, uh, what the repository looked like 12 minutes ago. Um, and the best thing about Git uh, and the worst thing for working at a company is this button here called blame. Uh, if I click the blame button, it'll illustrate this entire file and it'll tell me exactly when each line of this file was added. So like 12 minutes ago, you can see my first commit and then three minutes ago and three minutes ago, you can see the changes. Uh, I have an extension in VS Code called Git Lens. Um, that is amazing. Uh, Git Lens allows you to do things like this. If I put my mouse over a specific line, uh, it's not working right now. I don't know why. Is it actually, it's not installed? I thought it was. Anyways, it should be there, but it's not for some reason. I'm not going to debug it, but basically the same view that you have here with, uh, with Git blame in GitHub, you'll have in VS Code as well. You'll even have it too, where you put your mouse over a line and it'll show you specifically the commit that added that line. I don't know why it's not working. I don't really care. It's not important. Um, yeah, so this is GitHub. Um, with regards to the actual project that you guys will be doing, um, on our website, we have the uh, web service section with Flask, which has a bunch of the different examples. The example that Mo went through with the Hello Flask, you'll see how to do it here. You'll see an example we have here called Flask Math that has a bunch of different functions that allow you to do math via the uh, path parameters. We also have a rainbow flask example. That's an application that randomly um, gives you a backup page with a random background. You know what, might as well um, add this to the application. But let's say I'm working at a professional company. Um, usually developers don't just sit down all day writing code, things are a bit more structured. Um, GitHub has quite a few bells and whistles. It has pull requests, actions, projects, 
We're not going to worry about these. You can go into more detail. The Hello World guide talks about opening a pull request and merging a pull request. I'm not too concerned in this workshop about anything of that. But what I'm going to teach you is the idea of issues. So issues themselves are basically uh, things you can create to track. So this is a, a, um, a repository. Say if this was some amazing website and you want to create an issue. So I want to add a page that returns a random background color. So I'm going to submit new issue. And now there is an issue that exists on the repository itself um, that is now in the open state added by myself. Uh, it doesn't have any comments with no description uh, that states, hey, I want to add a page that returns a background color. So what's nice about GitHub is you can use GitHub to both keep track of collaboration with others through pull requests. There's the idea of forking where imagine if this was a lockdown repository that only I could commit to and someone else wanted to contribute to it, they could fork it. A lot of this terminology is honestly stuff that I'm not going to spend too much time on due to the constraints of this session. Um, but we have an issue. And this issue says I want to have a page that returns around a background color. So I'm going to take the example code that I've written here. I'm not going to care too much about it. I'm just going to come in here, copy paste it. I'm going to make a new route called slash rainbow. Um, for organization's sake, I'm going to put the random color function uh, here. I'm also going to do import random to import the random thing. This here will return a random hex code. There's an explanation of that in the docs. And this is a new route called slash rainbow that will return a HTML page. It probably would, would be better to do what uh, Mo did and actually make this a pro proper template. Um, but for now, this is just a F string with triple quotes, which allows us to define a uh, string across multiple lines that needs to escape these little brackets. And this here will invoke the random color function and return it here. Uh, this also should have this here. So I'm going to use the terminal this time, and I have changes to app.py. I can even do uh, git diff, and you'll see git diff outputs the diff between my current st uh, unstaged changes and the head commit that I'm on. You'll see all the added stuff here. Um, this is also modified to look a bit prettier using something called uh, diff so fancy. Uh, git status again, I always do git status, git add app.py, git status, there we go, it's green now, git commit dash m, rainbow flask. Uh, I'm also going to do something special here. I'm going to do number one. And now I have this commit, it's on my local, I want to push it up, git push origin master, and now I come back in here and you'll see rainbow flask number one. What's cool is if GitHub ever sees a dollar sign and a number, it'll actually connect it either to a pull request or an issue, depending on, because each pull request and each issue will have a number assigned with it. So I go to this and now what I can actually do as well is I can take this exact commit hash with this little copy button, because this commit hash identifies this commit, come back to the issue, now I can say, hey, you know, fixed in post. I can preview this. You'll see it'll actually render as a nice fancy commit hash and close with comment. Now I've closed this issue. Sadly, in the real world, issues are not that easy to close. Sometimes they're an absolute pain. Uh, Mo can back me up on that, but uh, yep. that's pretty much how it goes. Uh, and to actually show you how this looks, I'm going to do fast You'll never again. open your own issue and close it. <laughs> Within so five minutes, especially. That. Yeah, it's not how it goes. Uh, slash rainbow, and here we go. Rainbow flask gives us a nice random color. Pretty simple. Um, and yeah, uh, most of this stuff I've talked about is already up inside the actual docs. Um, there's also there's some also things a YouTube on YouTube video. Yep, you might want to uh, tell them about the YouTube video. Yeah, yeah, I did a session with Tech and this. This is an actual proper hour long discussion on the whole thing. Um, there's some links to on the basics of Git that go into topics such as uh, uh, branching and other things like that, team etiquette. 
Um, thankfully, you guys were working independently on this. You won't have to worry too much about stepping on each other's feet. It'll only be your own feet. Uh, I also have a section here that goes into some of the uh, why bother using Git. I, mean, I talked about this here, but um, talks about it in detail. Also, um, how does Git even work? For all you computer science folks, Git under the hood is a directed acyclic graph. Fancy nonsense. Um, if I come into this repository and I do ls, you'll see we've got three files, but we actually um, have one, two, three, four, five files. You'll see we have the git ignore, uh, but we also have something called a .git file. Um, I'm going to cd into .git just for the illustration purposes, and I'm going to do ls, and you're going to see a bunch of different files in here. Uh, if I do find, which will give me a whole bunch of, basically give me all the files in this directory in a tree structure, uh, find dot, you'll see an absolute ton of files. Thankfully, Git allows you to not care about any of this, but this is how Git works under the hood. I can do cd dot dot to go back a directory and uh, control L to clear that screen, because honestly, the, got, the dot Git directory is something you really don't have to care about at all. Um, but it's there, and that's how Git works at a more conceptual usually all level. All hidden directories, all hidden directories, you usually don't care about. So the reason why when you type ls in the beginning and it doesn't show is because it's a hidden directory, and you know that if you list all with the flag al, it will have a it will start with a dot. So any directory that starts with a dot is hidden, um, and uh, you won't be able to see it uh, yep. with the normal list. Uh, to talk about the man pages again. <coughs> If I do man ls, um, ls being list directory content, um, you will see in here that the uh, the dash a flag allows you to include directories whose names begin with the dot. Um, yeah, the last piece of this that I was going to go over was going to be uh, the web and HTTP. So there's been a few things that we've kind of glanced over during this um, workshop. And if you have any questions, of course, ask in the, uh, in the chat here, ask in the Discord. Um, and this is kind of a preface for tomorrow. So we have about 20 minutes left of the session. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes on this, and then we'll have some time for Q&As later, or if we finish up a bit earlier. I'm going to talk about um, web servers. So you've used the website before. Um, I'm going to most definitely assume. Uh, you kind of know the idea of what a URL is, you know, the idea you can like paste them, they bring you to pages on the internet, so on and so forth. Um, but I assume most people here haven't had to really care about how all that stuff actually works. Um, for the purpose of this uh, dev bootcamp, um, we're going to talk about uh, URLs. So a URL, as you might know, is the actual thing in your browser. Uh, Chrome likes to hide the beginning because I think Chrome doesn't want you to think it's important. But the first section of a URL is the scheme. Uh, then it's followed by the domain name. And then it's followed by the path and some other auxiliary things. Um, I have a nice little diagram in this. Just make this page a bit bigger. It talks about, uh, we have the scheme here domain name, the file path. Uh, we also have things known as query parameters and anchors. If you ever see, like you have to click on a heading in a page, you'll see it says dollar sign URLs. Um, this actually links you to a specific place on the page, which is kind of cool. You know, I can take this, I can close this tab and come then open a new, new tab and it'll bring me right to where it was before, which is quite nice. Um, and when we talked about like different routes and stuff in Flask, that's kind of what we were talking about basically. Um, in the hello world is pretty basic in that the example application we give you says that, hey, um, send any request to slash um, and return this string. Flask doesn't really care about the domain name. In, in the case of when, when you're doing local development, you have local host and you have colon 5,000 which localhost means it's your own machine. 5,000 means the port number. Um, 80 is implicit for HTTP and HTTPS is implicit for 443. A lot of this stuff is stuff you don't have to care about. 
Um, but yeah, that's how the actual route stuff works. You'll see, you know, in, in Rainbow Flask in our application, we define slash rainbow. So it meant that when we would go to localhost 5000 slash rainbow, this would send us down the route to return this. But then instead we go to, you know, slash foo, we get connection refused because I'm running the application, uh, running it again, slash foo, hello foo, slash bar, hello bar. So like things like Flask allows you to basically define catch all statements as well, which is quite nice. And we go into more detail in the, um, uh, the section on uh, Flask math as well. We actually do some math with uh, uh, variable rules. Um, and this is all done over something called HTTP. Um, there is in HTTP, there is a server that exists on the internet and there is a client. In the case of HTTP, your client is a web browser and the server in this case, you know, on our docs page, the server comes from GitHub itself. Your browser basically goes, hey, GitHub, I want this URL and GitHub goes, okay, cool. Here's the request. So I, you know, take this, refresh the page, it gives you some data, pretty simple. Um, so in the case of Flask, Flask itself would be the uh, HTTP server in this case, and the client would be the actual browser itself. Of course, this is local. Uh, in the case of the internet, you know, you have a machine somewhere, you know, we teach you Python anyway, you'll be hosting a Flask application on a, uh, on a machine hosted by them. And then your browser will reach out over the internet using dom domain names and stuff. And it'll actually resolve the address to an actual machine. And then it'll return your beautiful HTML. We have about 12 minutes to spare. Um, sorry if that was a uh, absolute brain dump, dump of information. Um, no, that was great, it was really <laughs> informative. Thanks Jack. The important stuff with this is that we're not here to necessarily teach you like, you know, Git and HTTP, it's good to know about this stuff from a conceptual level so you know what's happening. Um, but to be honest, you know, if you run some of these commands and they work and you don't understand them, that's okay. <laughs> you can you can still create your own portfolio website without knowing all the intricacies of everything of how everything works. It's more a matter of actually getting there in the first place. Um, in your career, there is, you know, most definitely ample time for you to learn how to do all sorts of this stuff on your own time. Um, yeah, I guess we can save the floors open for anyone who wants to show on their video, um, flick on their microphone as well to ask questions uh, to us, either me or Mo. Um, the actual chat, of course, is open for anyone. Um, I'm going to be checking the Discord quite a bit. Um, if anyone has any questions there, of course, once the session is over itself. Uh, do you have any parting words pre-Q&A, Mo? Um, a few things. Well, you did mention the Discord, so use bootcamp-help for any technical questions. Um, and we want to kind of uh, like uh, have the other participants answer the questions as well. If you know the answer to it, go ahead and do so. It's not just for us, it's just for everyone to get in and debug for each other. Uh, another thing is um, for the GitHub uh, part, we do want you to kind of go through that and have your portfolio up on GitHub. So at the end of the fourth session, when uh, we're kind of reviewing everyone's website, we want to go in and look at your history uh, and the code that you've written so we can evaluate like how good this website is and kind of decide where the prize, who the prize goes to. Um, also, Jack has the YouTube video for the, um, uh, for the like, full one hour session of, of, uh, of GitHub and Git. So if you want to watch that, you can do that as well. And this session is recorded and it should be up on our YouTube channel, uh, Kemal, I'm not sure when, but maybe in 24 hours, I think he said, or something like that. So uh, if you wanna watch this tomorrow, you can. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of it. Uh, if anyone has any questions, they can turn on their mic, the camera, or they can ask in the chat. If you want to ask later in the discord go ahead and do that as well but we're just going to sit here for maybe another five ten minutes uh to see if anyone wants to chat you don't even have to ask a question if you just want to talk go ahead and come in and talk uh so we'll just be chilling here i uh have one last thing to say before uh we open the q a um one thing i didn't i meant to mention is we've broken out some things into uh deliverables 
that you'll find on the website and the description of these here. Obviously, the final output of this entire uh, boot camp is each one of you having your own portfolio website. Um, but I've made a list of some things here that can be things you can do in the interim, because I don't think everyone here is ready just yet to hit the ground running. Um, but I've given the first kind of like deliverable being uh, getting your own Hello World Flask application up um, and doing your own twist with it. You know, I did the uh, I did the session, um, the Hello Flask, which is just Hello World, the Flask Math, which is some math functions in Flask and Rainbow Flask. If you guys want to see if you can take that and build your own, maybe you make um, it either like a magic eight ball flask that randomly choose an answer from a list of them or something like that. Um, and also some extra credit stuff as well. Uh, show us your rice. I know that uh, um, Mo posted using Dracula Dark. Um, if you guys have any cool themes you want to show off in the, uh, in the Discord, go right ahead. Uh, also, another thing as well is using GitHub issues. In general, if you want to keep everything that you do during this uh, bootcamp in a single GitHub repository, maybe break it up by folder, there's no reason not to. You know, it's great practice using Git um, and also great practice, you know, having actual stuff out there for your portfolio in the future. Um, but yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. And Kamal, if you want to stop recording, if uh, you don't mind, we can just switch to the uh, Q&A until people